OK, now we are. So good morning, everyone. I am Mattia Gianotti. I am a PhD student from Art3 uh, Lab, the laboratory that is uh, uh, managed by Professor Garzotto. And I am a computer scientist and, uh, and a computer software engineer. So basically what uh, I will try to give you today is the point of view of uh, um, uh, us engineers uh, while uh, do, dealing with uh, web architecture and applications in general. I know that uh, for many of you that are uh, present uh, in this lecture today, uh, the content of this lecture will be very well known, especially for those that are engineers. And I just want to uh, say to you engineers in this classroom that I know I will make a lot of uh, things much easier than what they actually are. Uh, but I, uh, the goal of this lecture is just to give you a very brief idea and a general uh, um, idea of what's going on uh, behind the scene. So I don't want to get really too much in deep with the technology uh, for the sake of your designer colleagues. Uh, but of course, uh, if there is any uh, doubt or technical uh, curiosity you want to ask, uh, I will be very glad to answer you. So uh, the uh, goal of today's lecture uh, is to present you this kind of uh, uh, topics. The first is what is the Internet? Because since we are talking about web technologies, uh, we think that is the best uh, starting point for you to understand what's behind the scene of the web in a general way, very general way. I will not I said to dig into it, but at least on a high level uh, structure of the net, we think it's important. Then we start analyzing web architectures and, and one specific case of web architecture is very, very important, which is client server approach. Uh, then we will dig with the problem of uh, uh, machine identification on the network. Uh, uh, the web technologies for websites, which is uh, I know that many of you already uh, know a little bit, so I will do a very, very um, high level introduction, also because this is going to be a topic uh, that will be held in a later lecture of this course. Then we will, I will try to uh, describe you some other important web architecture and applications that you may not be familiar of at a technical level, but that are very important uh, or for the scope of this project uh, or we think for uh, your future career as designers and people that are going to uh, work uh, in the uh, in a world that is that will be highly based on the technologies and specifically web technologies. Uh, then we will discuss about uh, web technologies for mobile application. Uh, and in the end of this lecture, I will try to give you a very brief description of the four different types of applications you may have. So responsive, native, hybrid, and progressive web application. I will not, of course, uh, talk to you about this for four hours consecutively. So I will stop more or less at each uh, topic uh, to let you uh, ask questions. And I think that in the middle, we will going to have a 20 minute break uh, where we'll stop the, the recording. Uh, so um, I, it's my first time doing a, a lecture in Teams. So if you if I'm missing something in the chat, please don't get mad. It's just that uh, it's my first time. Uh, but I will do my best to answer all of your questions in the most precise and uh, easy way uh, that I can. So uh, for the first topic that we want to understand is what is the Internet? And this is this question is surprisingly uh, extremely hard to answer and yet extremely uh, well known because Internet is something that is there uh, for something like 50 years now. So it's something that we know very well. And yet uh, what is the Internet is a still a very difficult question that 
we struggle to understand even nowadays. And the problem of this complexity is that we have a very complex structure of, uh, uh, of the network. You will see in this uh, image that the network is really composed of many, many different elements, many different nodes, uh, many different uh, terminology that we use. And this terminology may be even so old that most of you will have never used them. Uh, even I've, I have never used some of the, of the um, uh, nomenclature that is used for, for web technologies because it's, a, as I said, a very old uh, terminology that comes from the very beginning of the, of the web. But with this, this slide, what I want to show you is that uh, this uh, network, the internet is the net, and this net is a very complex net. It's not just made of uh, dots and lines, as many of the nets that we uh, that we know, but uh, those not uh, those knots or what we call it in the uh, web technology uh, language nodes uh, uh, are very uh, very difficult in the in nature. So, for example, you will see here uh, in this slide this uh, that then the nodes are connected with uh, different type of lines. One is a dashed line, what is a, a continuous line, what is a bold continuous line. And these three different elements mean very different things. And the nodes, even if they are always uh, machines, they are all, always computers, so they should not be so, so different, but actually have very different uh, capabilities, very different uh, roles, and also very different technologies working behind them according to, let's say, the color uh, of the node and the kind of link uh, that these nodes are connected to. And you will see also that there is a very huge difference uh, on the final uh, and external circle. So even uh, forgetting for a moment of what is in the middle of this uh, graph, so these uh, dots uh, and lines connecting at the external part of it, it we we'll see that there are a lot of different things and to be able to manage all these things it's actually what we engineers study but uh, i can uh, assure you that this is very very uh, important also for uh, you as a designers and just let me uh, uh, do you an example. You see that in this image, you have mobile devices that are connected to a mobile telephone network, notebook connected to router, and desktop workstation connected to a DSL modem over the telephone system. They are all uh, mobile devices that your user is going to be able uh, to access and that is going to use to have uh, access to uh, the service you may want to deliver to the network. However, what is exactly behind it, so the mobile telephone network, your Wi-Fi router, or the DSL modem connected to the, left, the, to the telephone system, it's actually very different in what you can uh, deliver them. Because, uh, uh, let's say that you want to transfer, you have created a very beautiful uh, website uh, with a, a very beautiful video uh, running in the background of your web page. And this is the best website you ever done. You have been paid so much to do it and you are so proud of it. And actually the only user that is going to be able probably to see uh, your video is the uh, notebook connected to the Wi-Fi router. Because on the mobile devices, if your video is too uh, heavy, uh, it's going to be uh, degraded or uh, ruined by the quality of the transmission. Whereas on the DSL modem, uh, you will never be able to uh, have a uh, quality or even to can see the video because the, 
the, the, um, the network is so slow at this point that maybe you cannot load it uh, fully um, uh, for what you need to do. And this may not be a problem, but if you want to, if your website was designed to access for to be accessed, for example, by older people or people uh, that stay uh, in the wild, in the farms or whatever, this is a very huge problem because uh, most of those people work on DSL modem still. And this means that you will never be able to reach your target client. So even if this seems to be trivial, sometimes trivial things are the ones that make the difference between uh, the success or the failure of your work. So it's important to uh, take in consideration these uh, aspects. Uh, if you want, in the slide, I have also uh, linked you uh, a, web, um, a reference on a very well uh, structured uh, content describing you uh, these elements of the network and how they work and how they are distributed in the, uh, in the space. And so if you want to uh, have a little bit more co uh, complete uh, description of what is there, uh, just refer to this website. Now, uh, one, th uh, one thing that I think it's important to do now is to establish a common terminology. Because as far as, uh, as Professor Gavzato said before, uh, many of you already know all the, all the concept of web technologies and how the web works. But actually, maybe you do not know the exact terminology or you are, uh, we as engineers and you as designers especially, uh, may have a different terminology uh, to go with it. Uh, so at least for the sake of this lecture, I think that it's uh, better that we clarify some of the terminology and so that we can uh, uh, go on in a more uh, easy and complete way uh, so that we will not lose too much uh, time trying to go back and understanding the different terminology that we are using. And uh, the first thing I want you to uh, understand is the importance of these Ethernet service providers uh, that for, uh, for us engineers are often called ESP. Uh, by the way, you will see that a lot uh, that we engineers love a lot acronyms and that we uh, almost all, all, all the times use acronyms uh, to shorten up the, uh, these terms. It's not often a very good idea because acronyms may be uh, difficult to read or maybe ambiguous, but that's something that is often used. So even if you search online for some material, uh, it's easier to find it uh, if you go for the um, acronyms instead of going through the, um, the complete name of the material. By the way, Ethernet service providers uh, is the very uh, complex name uh, to say the company that you pay to be able to connect to the internet. So uh, if, you are, if you have a modem from FastWeb or Vodafone or Team or whatever, Aruba, whatever, we want, that company is your internet, internet service provider. Why it is so important? It is so important because actually uh, you may also have a router. You can buy a router and create your network, but you will not be able to access the internet from that network. And this is just because the internet is just the connection of smaller networks and machines going out in the globe. And this internet service provider uh, let you uh, send information and connect to those machines that are outside your direct control. Uh, so it's very important for you to uh, choose your internet service provider well, uh, but it's also very important that you know that someone up there uh, is there understanding and hearing things soon, uh, sometimes or not. On the other hand, when you have an internet service provider, you have a point of presence where you try to connect. So it's nothing like the machine you're using. Uh, each of you now is using a laptop, so each of us is connected to a point of presence through a laptop or, or a mobile device. 
and possibly, uh, for example, I am uh, I am using now both my laptop and my uh, smartphone at the same time, so you have two point of presence in my hand now. On the other side of the point of presence, because now I am, I know that I am connected, I am on a device, I am connected on the network. Now to use this network, I need to go somewhere to reach someone. And this someone is actually uh, called a web server in general. It's a machine that uh, installed services accessible only to the network. Examples are uh, websites, e-commerce and many other things that we will deal uh, during this lecture later on. But the idea is that you have a machine somewhere uh, that is able to offer you something that you cannot achieve without the uh, the internet. And to be able to achieve to uh, access it, you need the network connection to, uh, to reach it. Uh, by the way, in the previous slide, you have seen that there is a uh, difference between a web server and an email server. Uh, this is one of the uh, very old style terminology that I was telling you, because in the uh, early uh, years of the web, uh, even if the, the machine are basically the same, uh, the functionalities and the structure of those machines uh, were very different. But an email server is just a web server that is dedicated to do just one thing, that is sending, recording, and uh, receiving emails. So nothing very complex. It's just that uh, for historical reasons, there is this difference between web server and email servers. But up to the moment, we have just talked about machines and now we need to uh, try to understand that uh, we have also not just machines, but we have also softwares. And the first software we want to describe is the client. Uh, by the way, this is actually a very ambiguous term. I will try my best to have to be consistent with the terminology. So I will use a uh, client host for the ma machine and uh, that is uh, the point of presence basically, or server host as a server machine. While if I talk about client as server, uh, I will almost, uh, I will try to use the term as uh, software uh, elements. However, this uh, terminology is ambiguous because uh, for most of us in engineering, um, it's obvious to which kind of device, uh, of which kind of uh, material we are discussing. So uh, we, we discuss, we talk, uh, uh, we talk about client and server, meaning both the machine and the software at the same time. As again, uh, again, I will try my best to be consistent with the terminology during this lecture. But if I slip it out, uh, it's just that it's a bad habit that is hard to die. So uh, please don't blame me for that, or at least don't, don't blame me too much for that. Um, one other important thing is router and gateway. Now, I know that engineers uh, are now having a, a reject for me saying them as one single thing, but for the sake of this lecture, uh, I will say that router and gateway are very similar in, the, in their goal, and that there are machines that separate uh, computer networks between uh, different sizes, and forward messages between the external part of the network and the internal part of the network. So uh, they are just like a gatekeeper in a medieval city. You can pass through them to uh, deliver information outside the network or you can uh, enter uh, uh, giving their permission in the city. So it is your, in your uh, um, smaller network uh, if they allow you to do it. I know that they are very different actually in uh, uh, hardware and and um, mm, how things uh, work behind them, but for the sake of it, please uh, let me go with this uh, simplified terminology. Um, I see that there is a, a question on the client term. Uh, I will try to explain me better. Um, with uh, the term client, uh, is 
generally uh, referred to the software running on a machine that is used by the user to access the network, something like the browser of your computer. But uh, for, uh, for us, uh, engineers, we often use a uh, client also to mean the machine, because actually the correct term is client host, uh, which since it is a little bit uh, longer and repetitive, and after a certain amount of time, it gets obvious if, you're, if we're talking about a machine or a software, uh, we just uh, use the same term and for uh, uh, anyone, any of us is able to understand if we are describing a machine or a software. I will try to use client and server and uh, client for the uh, software running on it. The same things apply to the term server. But in case uh, I, I slip, it slip out of my mind and I uh, use the term improperly, it's just that for a bad habit, it's very hard for me to remember uh, to use the term uh, client host instead of client to mean the machine. I, I hope uh, I uh, explained myself a little bit better. OK. Um, another uh, very important thing that is going to happen now, it's a server farm. A server farm actually is something that it was in, unthinkable at the beginning of the network because there was simply no budget to do it and no need to do it. But now server farms are one of the most important and uh, most research fields inside web technologies. And the idea is pretty simple. It's just that, it's just that uh, you have a bunch of servers server machines, server host, uh, that are linked together to do the same service. And the only reason you need to do it is just that if you have millions of people connecting to your server machine, trying to uh, answer you, uh, trying to ask you something, you're not able to answer them back to all of them. And uh, this uh, can be solved quite easily by splitting the uh, the request on different servers that do the same thing, and that's the basic concept of a server farm. Uh, just to give you examples, Google, Amazon, Facebook, all the major uh, IT companies that offer you services online um, works with uh, server farms because they will not be able to uh, give you enough uh, capabilities to respond to all the people in the world if they are not doing so. The last thing is network access point. So for the moment you have in your network, you have uh, your internet service provider that is connecting uh, all the machines that pay for uh, pay him to a network. But now what happens if I have to ask to uh, someone uh, that is not connected to my network. For example, I am under FastWeb. Professor Gazotto may be under Vodafone. How can I call uh, a computer that is not in my internet service provider network? And the answer is there is a higher level uh, network. And this network connects the different inter internet service providers and, and we can exchange data over it. The connection point is this network access uh, point or NAP. The, I hope it's not what you are doing right now after 30 minutes listening to me. Uh, but the idea is that thanks to, uh, to this uh, higher level network, uh, we are able to have internet. Because otherwise, we just have a bunch of computers connected uh, to the same internet provider but we are not able uh, to receive information that stands somewhere else. And this means, for example, that we will not be able to uh, ask Google something because Google is in New York and it's not under the same. We will be able to ask Internet or what uh, uh, to ask Google 
or any other major American uh, institution. So how does this work? And the idea is that we have this backbone connection that in Italian we call the la dorsale, which is a very fancy name, uh, remembering the spine of the human body. That is this uh, massive, huge network of uh, high quality, high performing uh, optic fiber cables running throughout all the oceans and the seas in our um, in our world. And you will see that in this image, uh, there is a very huge uh, distribution of these channels. And there are basically two main lines. One is between Europe and America on the Atlantic Ocean, and one is between uh, uh, USA and uh, China in the Pacific Ocean. And these two are the uh, two ma major lines of the network. If something happens here, it means that the, net, the internet is down for everyone in the world. And that's going to be a huge of a problem. And that's why we have so many lines, because even if one single line is broken, we have all the other lines that work the same. Now, a curious aspect is that even if this is one of the most titanic and costly efforts that have ever been done in software, in software and hardware engineering uh, to place these kind of cables so efficiently in the, uh, south, uh, in the um, bottom of the oceans, uh, using them for internet service provider is free. And simply that's because uh, uh, the internet service provider agreed that considering the amount of traffic that follows between them, it's pointless to make you pay because uh, if uh, internet provider A is in Europe and internet provider B is in uh, USA, I have the almost the same amount of data flowing from A to B than B to C. And, and given that uh, it's absolutely uh, useless to decide to uh, make you pay for it because I will pay you exactly as much as you have to pay to me back. So the result is this a, a very important agreement that uh, say basically that uh, no matter what, uh, these lines are free to use for the, all the internet service provider around the world. And that's the only reason we have internet so much spread and free uh, now. So all, all thanks to this, we now are able to talk about uh, web technologies and we are able to do even lecture nowadays in this uh, very complex situation. So this is a very important thing, but it's not so much uh, interesting, right? I mean, who cares? We know that we have internet and that's all. Uh, we will see in the in continuous of this lecture that this may be something that affect even uh, your future design in solutions. So I uh, will stop for uh, a couple of, um, for something like five minutes. Uh, uh, so I leave you uh, in the possibility to ask me a question in the chat. Uh, then I, I think we can come back to this new topic so that uh, at least uh, you can uh, um, try to memorize and understand most of these topics that I know are not very easy to, uh, to take all in one, uh, one shot.
So if there are no questions about the topics that we uh, discussed so far, I think we can go on on the next uh, topic. Please, someone give me a feedback. OK. OK, thank you, guys. So now that we have. OK, so now that we have uh, almost under, understood what's uh, behind the scene, so what is the Internet and how at a very high level it works, uh, we can now try to understand what is a web architecture. And to do this, uh, I think that first of all, we need to understand what is a software architecture. And software architecture is not exactly what you expect it to be. Uh, because when no people normally think about architecture, they think on the uh, building architecture. So make things that are stable, make things that stay together, but they are also beautiful and uh, uh, that are pleasant to see and be uh, and then someone else is going to make them feasible to build. Actually, when uh, engineers, especially software engineers, talk about architecture, uh, it, is a, it has a slightly different meaning. Uh, because when we talk about architecture, we talk about uh, how things are organized and how things work mm, practically. So nothing about aesthetic, nothing about uh, how things should look like, but how things are going to be made. And the architecture is a high level, any software architecture actually, is a high level representation of three different elements that you need uh, to take into account. And that's going to uh, um, give you uh, the main concepts on which you are going to uh, to work on. And these elements are uh, the elements that are involved in your system. So uh, staying in the concept of these uh, web technologies, but not just uh, related to that, you have devices that you want to use. So you have uh, your mobile uh, tel telephone or your desktop computer. Uh, you have the servers that are somewhere spread uh, on the network. You have external uh, information that comes uh, through your uh, through you, but you need them uh, to work. You have your database, so your your data, uh, and so on and so forth. It may be very simple. It may be very complex. Just for in the amount of uh, elements that are involved and the complexity of, of of things that can be done. The easiest architecture. Uh, the one that we will discuss later on is basically composed of two, two to three different elements, uh, while high complex architecture, such as uh, probably the magic room you've seen in Professor Cazzotto uh, lecture, is composed of uh, uh, 27, if I remember correctly, uh, different devices connected. So you see that there is going to be a very huge difference according to the scale of the project and the number of uh, items that is going to be there. But it's not just an architecture is not just uh, the elements that you want to consider. You need to consider also how those elements are connected. And this may be connected by wire, by internet connection, by Bluetooth, by any other things. So why is this important? Because for example, uh, if you want to make uh, a smartwatch uh, that is very efficient, uh, you know that probably Bluetooth uh, is not going to work so well. Even if nowadays it's still uh, the uh, most used technology to connect uh, uh, smartwatches and fit bands to your, smart to your smartphone, uh, Bluetooth is very uh, power consumptive. So you, if you want to have something that stays on, for example, for days, it's not the best idea to make it inside a 
uh, Bluetooth connection. On the other side, if you want to have it that runs inside the um, uh, wild, so for example, for um, archaeological exploration or something like that, you cannot have access to the uh, to the internet. So you cannot use that kind of uh, technology to connect. And so you have to uh, balance out and try to understand what is the uh, best compromise between what you uh, desire and what is technically uh, possible to achieve. And all this is done through the architecture, even before starting to, uh, to write a single line of code and buying the components to make your own uh, system. So it's very important to do it beforehand while the discussing on an architecture instead of doing it later on and having waste a lot of money uh, and time uh, before. Last but not for importance, uh, uh, it's one of the most important things you have to do inside an architecture is to identify the most important functionalities uh, that each element possess. And this means that if I have 27 different elements inside my architecture, each of them must have a meaning. If I find that one object has no actual uh, functionality inside my architecture, probably that component is just useless. So why bother to consider it? And also another very important thing is that uh, by understanding what's going to be, to, uh, it's going to, uh, to work on, so uh, what is the functionality that you need to insert inside your system, uh, you may understand that some of the elements you have uh, designed or some connection you have designed are actually not going to work. So reasoning on high level architecture is important. But I know that I cannot fully convince all of you in into this discussion why it's important to uh, this, uh, decide on architecture and reason them. So I give you other three points that, in my opinion, are worth enough uh, that anybody, not just uh, engineers and designers, but anyone that is going to have to, do, to deal with uh, a software uh, for any reason in the world, uh, should consider reflecting on architecture. The first thing is that reflecting on architecture is able uh, is um, through reflecting on architecture, it is possible to analyze the cost of the development and management of the system. And trust me, uh, especially the cost of maintenance is something that is very difficult uh, difficult to um, to measure, but it's actually one of the most expensive things inside uh, software development. And this because uh, even if you deliver the simplest website ever, you need someone that from the moment the website, the website is accessible till the moment you switch off uh, the, the website, you remove it from the internet, you need someone that update the content and update the aesthetic of your website uh, so that uh, you are not going to um, that your website is still uh, running and updated every time uh, that you are going to have uh, to do something. Because otherwise, your website is there, you are paying for uh, the, uh, um, for your website to be online, but no one is going to visit it because it's uh, not updated and not working anymore. Also, you can decide how many people you need to hire to do it and what the, what are the costs you have to pay uh, yearly later on. So this is quite, quite something that is uh, very meaningful for anyone that want to deal uh, on a pro level, let's say, with, so, uh, with a web technology or with any technology in general, uh, but it's something that especially designers that uh, are uh, asked to um, devise solutions uh, should take into account. Another very important thing you need to consider uh, on the architecture is, is that 
by reflecting on your architecture, you can understand uh, where some of the functionalities should be considered. And this is not just a, uh, it's not just a trivial uh, way of saying, OK, uh, where should I put the code? And if I can pay someone less uh, because it requires less uh, uh, competence to do uh, to this function inside this part of the code, for example, in your in your uh, 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 web page, uh, then I should go for it. Let me uh, give you uh, an example. So suppose you have a very simple website, uh, but you need to uh, let the user authenticate. So you ask the user for a password. Nothing strange. My question is, where should the password be checked? And I give you two options. One option is, is to check the password inside your browser. So you input the thing and the web page itself check that your uh, password is correct. The other option is that you send the password to your server and the server is going to uh, read it and check if it's correct. By an economical point of view, it's much, much easier to do it in the client because the technology is quite easier. And so you can pay less the, uh, the programmer because you need a less skilled programmer. But if you make it in the client, uh, you have to send uh, to the client machine uh, the password that is saved somewhere. And so you lose control control of it and someone may sniff it. So maybe uh, I'm not the one that is trying to access with the password, but by typing a wrong password, I can get the password and, and that's that's fine. I see that some of you is suggesting the server, but actually I tricked you because what happens if I want to uh, just check, for example, a very simple thing, something like, OK, the password uh, must be composed of one capital letter, one lower letter, one number, and one symbol. If I ask the, uh, the server to do this every time, I continuously have uh, the client asking the server, is this password correct? And the uh, server is saying, no, I'm missing carters. And then it's going back to the user saying, you, have, uh, you still need uh, to update the password. And you go on with this uh, ping pong between the client and the server for maybe a long time. And if you do this for thousands of people trying to connect to your server, the result is that no one is going to be able to access your server because the server is still uh, occupied by trying to understand who set the password right and who's not. So the result is actually that you have to do uh, the password check in between. So one part on the ser on the client and one part on the server. But only by analyzing your architecture, you know uh, which part should be where and, and if it's meaningful to do it, because this is a cost. So maybe this is a good solution, but maybe other solution can be possible depending on your specific case. And that's just you, uh, something you can just decide by analyzing uh, your architecture. Last but not least, uh, is that by analyzing your architecture, you can understand what really you should do and what you can um, take from someone else. So just let me do a very extreme example. Uh, if I want to create the new uh, Google Calendar, and I want to say something like, OK, uh, if you uh, create an appointment and that appointment is uh, this um, should, is placed somewhere in the outside, I check the weather forecast and in the uh, in the for, uh, in the weather forecast, I, um, I check if the bad weather is scheduled is a forecast for the day of your appointment, I send you with one week advance uh, saying you should change your plans. 
of course, I should not make again the weather forecast system because someone else has done it and it's available on the network. So I should not pay millions of euros for someone developing a new forecast system and, and wait years for that system to work, actually. It's very easy, but I can do it again only by analyzing uh, the architecture to really uh, decide what elements are there and what not. So yes, uh, you just should only do character checking for validation on the front end and all the rest should be done in the uh, uh, in the server. That's right. Is there any questions so far? Something that uh, it's not clear, something you want to comment on? Okay, fantastic. So let's go for one example of a very state-of-the-art uh, possible web architecture. And this is the most famous architecture uh, ever made. It's client-server approach. It's something that comes back from the 60s and we are still using it because it's so uh, useful and so practical. Uh, that we are still needing this kind of architecture to work. And this is basically the architecture that all the World Wide Web is using uh, to provide you services. So it's something quite important and actually quite easy to, to get in the end. So the idea is that we have a distributed application structure, meaning that uh, you take your own application and you divide it into different elements and these different elements that will be divided in a certain uh, certain specific way that we'll describe later on uh, are divided on basically two machines one is called uh, the server and server machine or the server software stay on the server host and and the other one is the client uh, host uh, and the client uh, program. So the idea is that you have one machine, the server machine or server host running one, pro one or more server programs that share their resources to the clients. Whereas you have a dozen of, dozen million, whatever, uh, client host that request content from the service on the server and yet they are not sharing any of their resources. So anything that is on the client is safe unless specific situation in which you send data on, uh, on the server through the client, but everything that is on the server may be accessed by all people uh, that try to connect with the client to that server. That's basically the uh, the whole game around it. For sake of um, reasoning and for sake of uh, clarification in the terminology, uh, I say that client and server actually uh, may be uh, have other names and the one that is most used is the client is called front end while the server is called back end and the rule of thumb to decide what should be placed inside the client and what should be placed inside the server is that uh, if you want something that uh, can be manipulated directly by the user this should be in the front end whereas uh, everything that should not be touched by the, uh, the user should stay in the backend in the server. Remember that this technology comes from the 60s and at that moment of time uh, performance, so the, uh, the amount of 
computation that was possible and the amount of information that could flow through the network were really an issue. So this kind of approach uh, is often um, uh, there is one big limitation in this kind of approach, and it is that the server is extremely lazy. It's just answering your client request. It's never providing you any information directly. So the flow of data in any client server application is that you have your client in the, in the device that uh, prepare a request. That request pass to a network and reach the server. On the server, it is elaborated, modified, whatever it is, uh, uh, and you get a, an, an answer. That answer is sent back through a network and finally reach uh, you as a device. But the vice versa can never occur. So even if you have, uh, if you need your server to give you information on what's going on in the computation, in the in its computation, like for example, uh, in a game, in a, in, a, in a web game, where the server has all the knowledge of uh, how the player, all the players are working, and the different players knows just what they have done, but they do not know the other um, situ uh, the, the other player situation. With a pure client server approach, it's your game on your device that is continuously asking for the server uh, for the uh, the state of all the other players. And this is why online gaming is consuming so many uh, data on the network in most of the cases. Now, modern technology, uh, we know that there are kind of different architecture that can uh, sort out these kind of problems, but still, uh, the reason why gaming is so uh, demanding in terms of uh, network connection and why uh, in these days there was this uh, question about uh, Sony and Microsoft that needed to reduce the quality and the amount of um, online gaming available on their console is just because they are consuming so many uh, data uh, that the, the global network uh, saturated and is not able to, um, to provide with the uh, required efficiency and uh, quality uh, the services for everyone. Uh, just another uh, note of color, um, this kind of server approach uh, uh, has an historical meaning, but uh, it has also another historical name uh, that you may find sometimes. It's not very common and not very polite actually, uh, but it's called the uh, master-slave approach. Technically speaking, the master-slave approach is a little bit different, but still uh, often, uh, especially in old, uh, in old books and uh, old uh, documents, this current server approach uh, is called the uh, master-slave approach. So if you find it, uh, know that it's something very, very similar to this, and sometimes it means exactly this client server approach, but no one uh, nowadays is using this uh, terminology. Now, uh, if any one of you is still listening to me at this point of the lecture, someone should have got this question, but how can I find someone in the network. I mean, there are so many uh, machines uh, attached to the network. How can I find the one they specifically want uh, to achieve? And the answer is not exactly easy. I will try to give you uh, the, um, the answer in, uh, in a few moments, but if you have any doubts up to now on the client server approach, please stop me here because otherwise you will get lost uh, in uh, hell and I will not be able to recover you uh, uh, during all the, uh, the next part of the lecture. So 
if no one is asking any question, I go on. Otherwise, I will have to stop now and uh, answer the question. OK. OK, I assume no one has doubts on client server approaches. So the idea uh, is that uh, we have machines in the network, and each machine in the network will be uh, identified somehow. Because if I want to reach that machine, I need to identify it to understand where should they go. It's just like going to your friends on the other side of the town to deliver a parcel. Uh, to go there, you need to know his address. But on machines, how do we do? And the answer is that we have dozen of possible alternatives, uh, but the, the one that is most common and that we are going to um, describe for the sake of this lecture is just a very tiny part of this uh, huge problem that is the uh, Internet Access Protocol uh, problem, or for sure, for short, IP problem. And the idea is that this is actually part of the most known TCP IP infrastructure. But given that, uh, to describe you what is uh, the full TCP IP infrastructure, I have to go very deep in technology uh, to describe you something that is very unlikely you ever mm, will ever do or deal with. Uh, I will stay on a higher level, on a more intuitive level, that is just the internet protocol addresses. And the idea is that any machine has a unique uh, number. And this number identify, identifies univocally uh, your machine throughout your network. There are actually two different uh, uh, possible approaches for creating this kind of addresses. One is called EPV4, which is a little bit older. Uh, and from last years, it's getting more popular IPv6 uh, format. Uh, but the idea is that you have this complex number and uh, this complex number uh, is just um, identifying you, uh, your machine uh, in a very uh, precise way inside your network. Uh, IPv4 is composed of four numbers, each number going from 0 to 255, uh, whereas IPv6 is composed of eight numbers from 0000, 0, 0, 0 to FFFF. And the reason why we have letters is that not that we have MED, but that each digit inside this number is an hexadecimal number, so going from 0 to 15 in values. And since we cannot use two digits to write 15, we use uh, the first five letters of the alphabet. Uh, that's just a convention uh, of translation, but that's, that's the reason why you have this strange FFFF uh, format uh, of numbers. Why do we need to pass from IPv4 to IPv6? It's just that uh, IPv4 has uh, no more numbers to identify all the devices that uh, were present on the network a few years ago. Uh, so uh, we had to invent something new. Otherwise, uh, we will not be able to address anymore uh, the, um, all the possible uh, uh, addresses present on the network. And of course, uh, even if I said to you that you have one of these uh, addresses, some of these addresses cannot really uh, be used. It's something like uh, the uh, in the phone numbers uh, 911 for United States or 112 in uh, Europe. Uh, those two numbers cannot be given to anyone because they have a special meaning. They are emergency calls. And the same things goes for uh, some uh, uh, IP addresses that have a special meaning. But there are very uh, limited amount of, of them, so mm, you sh should not really worry so much about it. And the other important thing you should know is that uh, an IP address 
depends on the network. So uh, I can uh, I can say for sure that now all your uh, uh, computers have an IP address which is 192.168. Uh, uh, dot something and this means that your machine is uh, inside a local network so it's inside uh, the network created by your house router uh, and this is because the initial part of the um, of the network of the address uh, differentiate between the different um, type of networks so you have local network, you have regional network, you have a national network, you have um, uh, internet service provider network and so on and so forth. And at each level you have a different initial part of the uh, of the address. Uh, so this is why you have uh, an IP address that always start the same when you're connected to a local to a house network. And this is also why uh, uh, your client, uh, so your mobile device or laptop, will change uh, its IP address when you go, for example, from your house to Politecnico di Milano. Because you are going to change the network and you are going to uh, get a different IP address for that network. This means that your device is using a, a dynamic IP address. And this is very common for uh, mobile device and clients that uh, people uh, work on, because it's actually very easy to do and very efficient. Uh, think, of, think of this. If we are not going to change the addresses in Politecnico di Milano, uh, we will have registered all the IP, uh, IP addresses of, of all the uh, smartphones of the graduated and the dead, um, uh, and also the phones of the dead professors, for example. And this means, or that graduated actually, uh, and this means that at a certain point, we will not be able to add uh, new smartphones or new com computers of current, current uh, um, um, students because all the uh, addresses have already been taken by someone else. And this is not acceptable. On the other hand, instead, uh, uh, this does not work uh, for servers because if, if you want to uh, reach your uh, to reach your friend to give him a parcel and he is continuously moving his house uh, somewhere in the city, you will never be able to reach him and give him this damned parcel. So you want him to stay somewhere uh, blocked some in a static position and that's why for servers we use uh, static IPs. It means that once you decide which is the address of that server, uh, this is not going to change no matter what. There is just one slightly problem in, in this thing and the problem is that uh, this works wonderful for machines but actually uh, if you want to this, uh, to reach google.com, you don't want to remember that Google is uh, 10, 11, 71, 122. Because it's meaningless. For any human, uh, that kind of address is absolutely meaningless and pointless to remember. So we have designed a slightly different approach that is giving uh, the uh, um, uh, the address is a name which is meaningful, something like www.google.com. And, and these names are called URL, uh, Universal Resource Locator, but also uh, has another meaning that's what's going to be uh, dealt with in the next slides, uh, which is the domain problem. And the domain problem, it's not trivial at all. It means uh, what is the name in which, uh, with which someone is going to be able to reach my service th uh, through a network. 
And trust me, this is kind of a nightmare actually to uh, to manage it. I will try to give you a very simplified version of this mess. Um, but still, it's going to be quite of a, uh, quite of a problem. So if it's everything OK for you, I will go on. Otherwise, stop me uh, for questions. OK, I assume that no question is going to rise on this IP address. So let's go with this problem. The problem of domain naming service and the name uh, domain name resolution is one of the most critical aspects in uh, web technologies because users do not use numbers, as we said, but machines do not use the names user use. Uh, so how can we uh, uh, manage uh, this kind of duality in uh, identifications? And the solution that has been uh, taken is this DNS uh, query uh, program, where DNS stands for Domain Naming Service. Uh, and the idea is that I ask, a server uh, that knows that's going to give me the other. So I have a server somewhere that knows that www.google.com is equal to some, to some extent to 10, 15, 17, 182, or whatever it is. Now I need to find this server and ask him what is the address. And actually, this cannot be one simple server because, first of all, it must be always reachable and no one, everyone should know who this server is. And the second problem is that the amount of uh, possible alternatives and the number of possible addresses uh, that have been used and translated into numbers is so huge now, now that it counts to billions and billions of possible alternatives to check. And it's quite complex. And uh, uh, more often, uh, this uh, process of understanding is so common and it happens so many times consecutively on all the computers and all the uh, machines connected to the internet, that if just one program is going to manage all of these together, uh, this program is going to explode in minutes or even seconds, probably. <clears throat> so uh, it has been devised a, a multi layer complex structure to deal with this problem. And the program is then spread into three different levels, root, uh, top level domain, and authoritative DNS servers. So what is the goal of these three uh, uh, um, systems? The first is the root DNS server. And it means that uh, these very complex uh, servers are known to anybody in any place of the world, uh, they, uh, their address is encoded in almost any uh, device for uh, um, uh, internet connection, and uh, they have the they are the first one that are called for anyone. So they just um, analyze the uh, your address. So you want to uh, device uh, www.google.com they go for the last part of the address, which is called top level domain, and decide among all the uh, top level domain uh, DNS server that they know where they are, uh, which one you should call. And they send your request to that top level domain ser uh, server. 
one a couple of curious things. So uh, in this slide, you see the distribution of the root uh, domain name service uh, server uh, throughout the world. And you see that there are very, uh, very few. Yes, the last part of the address is the .com part. Uh, you see that in, in this map, removing the uh, green ones for, the, uh, for this moment, they are just uh, useful uh, because of the uh, geographical position uh, in which they are. So skip, uh, skip them for the moment. You have just 14 uh, different uh, spots uh, all over the world for root DNS dispersion server. And the reason is pretty funny. Uh, the reason is that uh, this, uh, when this system has been devised in the 60s, uh, there was no more spaces in the addresses to save more than 14 uh, different machines. So that's why uh, just 14 machines exist actually uh, at, that mo uh, at the moment of time. And since no one changed that protocol uh, whatsoever, uh, the result is still that uh, we have 14 machines uh, for this um, for this service, which is absolutely vi uh, vital for the whole functioning of the network. Uh, it it was the case in the early uh, 60s and 70s where uh, there was uh, the first hacker attacks uh, going around in the network, and the most simple way to block the whole network on the whole planet is to uh, stop this root, um, root DNS. Because if no one is able to uh, describe, to uh, resolve the addresses, no one is ever going to be able to, um, to reach anything on the web. And actually, uh, since these facilities are very well guarded, uh, no one there to enter there and destroy the machines. Uh, so Acker uh, created uh, what we call now uh, denial of service uh, attacks. At that moment of time, it was quite uh, hard to make, but now it's a very common type of hacker attack in which you just uh, send so many million of requests to a server that the server is no more able to uh, answer anyone. And since all the internet protocols are based on a, a, a certain timing, so that if you uh, do not answer me back in, uh, let's say, 10 milliseconds, for example, I say that, okay, I lost your, uh, the communication to you. It was easy enough to say that by uh, delaying the root uh, DNS uh, enough, no one is going to be able to have access to the network, even without um, actually doing any harm to the network itself. So it was a very powerful attack and stopped the, um, the internet connection for some days uh, all over the world. And the result has been that uh, this uh, root uh, DNS have been changed technically from single servers to server farm. So each of these spots is actually a small server farm uh, so that the denial of service attack uh, became impo uh, almost impossible. It's not that it's really impossible, but it's still extremely hard to make uh, nowadays. The other curious aspect is that if you overlap this map to the map of the backbone, you will not notice something very peculiar, and this that uh, almost all of this uh, uh, root the DNS are uh, located very, very close to the um, the end of the backbones uh, of the uh, of those uh, extremely uh, powerful uh, uh, fiber optic cables uh, composing the backbone of the network, and this is because this root uh, network, uh, uh, this root DNS, uh, are so vital for the uh, functioning of the network, that they must be easy accessible uh, wherever you are. So that's why they are very close to the backbones, 
because it's actually the best and most uh, powerful place to be in uh, for a network uh, to be uh, to be based. But then we need to go to the lower level. So we were at the point where we had www.google.com and we know in the root DNS uh, that we need to ask for the top level domain DNS that is managing all the dot com um, um, addresses. So we ask, so each uh, root DNS knows the address of all the top level domain uh, DNS and they ask them directly, who is this www.google? And you will see that uh, there are many, many, many top level domain. This is just an infographics for the most common, but actually not all of them are here. And you see that there are basically uh, two level, two different type of um, uh, top level domains. And one is the institutional state level, something like EU, uh, IT, F F FR, US, uh, RU, um, dot Asia, mm, dot uh, ES for Spain, and so on and so forth. So basically, um, you have this kind of uh, re um, state uh, or agglomeration of state uh, top level domains, or you have this kind of uh, .com, .net, .org, which are uh, international and uh, widespread uh, top-level domains. There is another category, actually, which is the test top-level domain, but they are very, very rarely used, so don't bother about them. And the idea is that this kind of top-level domain you choose, it's actually uh, giving information on what kind of website you want to use. So, for example, if I am a company, I will go for a .com uh, top-level domain because from there I have um, much more uh, visibility on the network if someone is searching for an industrial or, uh, uh, or a company. On the other hand, uh, something like dot org is used for um, or, um, organizations and uh, uh, voluntary um, uh, um, organizations so that uh, if you are searching for uh, um, I don't know uh, Croce Rossa or something like that you will probably find uh, it under dot uh, org um, um, domain top level domain but again, even if we have uh, really shrinked a lot uh, the kind of uh, addresses that each of these machines uh, has to deal, there are still so, uh, too many. So even at this level, uh, actually, the top level domain DNS is not, not able to give me the address of www.google.com. It's just saying me, OK, I know at this point that there is an authority uh, DNS, so someone that is below my level that actually knows where the site is. So I analyze the part that say Google and the site. Okay, this is your um, the one that I need to ask uh, to, and he knows the address, so he asks directly the authority DNS. And this finally uh, knows you, your address. So going back in this uh, uh, in this mess of requests, you are on your client. You want to connect to uh, contours.com, and you ask it on uh, on the root uh, DNS. It goes back and asks for a uh, uh, top level dot com uh, dot com uh, authority uh, sorry a top level domain dot com dns and this one has to contorso dot com which is the authority dns and this contorso dot com dns finally answer you saying 
uh, it is in 131.107.0.11. And this finally reach you back on the client. And then finally your client can connect to those um, may.one.contos.com uh, server somewhere in the network. So you see that this is a very complex path and this path is can be quite long, but actually is the one that is most used and one that is um, most using the network uh, for anything. So, uh, uh, for what's go what's going to happen is that these um, these passages are going to be made not just when you want to reach a website, but also, for example, when you want to send an email. When you want to send an email to mattia.genotti at polymi.it, you have to do exactly the same thing because, again, uh, that email string is meaningless for a machine. He has to know an address, and, and that address actually has to be resolved exactly the same way uh, for your email uh, than on how you uh, resolve this uh, for a website. I know this is not easy, but let me just add a couple of more things and then I will stop for a moment for the eventual questions you have. So we were discussing up to now about domain and domain, as I said, is the naming of your website or your URL. Uh, but now, uh, what is the difference between a domain and a host? Because this is one of the most crucial aspect uh, between which uh, especially software engineers and designers uh, struggle a lot in understanding. And the, differ differ the difference is very easy and yet crucial. But remember that for every anything on the network, you need both the domain and the hosting. So you cannot skip one of them uh, for the other. And you just need to remember that the domain is your uh, the name you uh, you are using, and this can be purchased by a domain name register. Depend the cost, it's between ten and fifty euros per year, uh, sorry dollars per year, and it mainly depends on the extension. So if I go for a top level domain that is dot com it's probably a little bit more than $50 per year. Uh, if I'm going for a .io, which is very common for engineers in this last years, it's around $10 per year, per year. So it's quite cheap actually, uh, but it's meaningless. If you have just a domain, you cannot do anything. And on the other side, you have the hosting. So you have to pay someone that give you a machine, a soft uh, server machine, uh, where you can uh, put your uh, materials to be accessible online. And to go that, you need to go for a hosting company. And just to give you a hint, uh, hosting is billed monthly in general. It's very rare to have it annually, but it's something like 10 to $50 per month. So it's 10 to 12 times more than what you spend for uh, uh, the domain. And this is just an optimistic uh, um, situation for a very uh, easy uh, host. The cost may reach very, very high level cost uh, depending on the space, so the amount of uh, petabyte you need to have in your device, in your server machine, sorry, and the number and the bandwidth, so the amount of possible connection that your server is able to serve uh, simultaneously. And you reach a certain point where it's impossible to rent a host and you have to buy your own machine. And that's why, for example, Google and Amazon 
that need server uh, server farms do not uh, rent hosting, but both the, the servers, both the terrain and create their own uh, server, uh, huge server farms around the world uh, to work on. But if you want to try in the slides, I uh, gave you a couple of links. Uh, the first is for Alta Vista, uh, which is uh, useful to create uh, uh, very easy websites and is giving you a personal domain and a very, very, very limited amount of space and bandwidth uh, for free. You can try it, uh, something there. Uh, you can also try a rock actually for hosting if you are a little bit more skilled. Uh, because then you have to manage also the uh, the server part uh, in a more uh, decisive way. Uh, but if you want to have uh, something that is really accessible on the network, because Alter Vista is very easy, uh, very hard to find anything um, that is under uh, altervista.org uh, domain. If you want to have something that is even a little bit uh, accessible on the network, I suggest you to go for this uh, GoDaddy website, which is a very famous and low-cost low uh, hosting uh, uh, system so that you can have your accessible uh, host uh, in the network for, for example, your own professional websites uh, for future, future use in your uh, career. OK, before talking about the difference between server and services, is there any question about uh, DNS, IP, domain, uh, whatever? OK. OK, wonderful. So. Uh, another uh, aspect that you need to be uh, wary of is that uh, it's often uh, easy that someone is uh, confusing server and services. Uh, and this is again another very uh, struggling point uh, in which uh, designers and software engineers often uh, find themselves fighting. Uh, because they are thinking they are talking the same thing, but actually they are not. Uh, remember that a survey host is a machine that hosts the computation of some known graphical program or hosting some data. What does it mean? It means that you have a machine that runs a program, uh, and that program is not able uh, to be rendered in Windows or uh, any other kind of graphical interfaces you want. If you really want to, to access a server machine, you need to go there and type things on a, console, on a command line, which is something you will never want to do uh, unless it's extremely necessary. Uh, and the, uh, but the, nonetheless, a server is able to store multimedia data. So don't worry about that. Uh, you are still able to save uh, your images, videos, and whatever on the server. It's just that you cannot see them on the server, on the server machine directly. You need to access the server through other devices or other uh, programs, and then you can see the files in there on your computer. But remember that one server may contain more than one service at the same time, and this service or server program, let's say, uh, may not be all yours. So there are basically just three different uh, alternatives uh, you can have. The first one, which is the cheapest in absolute, is the shared hosting um, approach. And what is the idea? The idea is that you have several server programs running on the same machine, and they all share their resources and uh, the content, uh, which is very cheap, but actually it means that if you have the data of your client, anyone on that uh, machine can read, modify, or uh, do 
something that you don't want to on your client's data, which is something you should not uh, allow. So shared hosting uh, can be used, but can be used only for very extremely simple things uh, with uh, no need basically for the uh, users uh, to input anything. Uh, just for example, a web page uh, that gives you uh, static information or very easy information that you should not change. This was a very popular solution uh, some years ago, uh, but now almost no one is using it. So if someone is going to propose you to use a shared hosting approach because it's cheaper, uh, remember that there's a reason why no one is using it anymore. What's really using now as one of the most uh, common uh, solution is this virtual private server hosting. And the idea is that you still have a server machine that is uh, running different programs, but those programs uh, all have specific um, uh, a specific amount of memory, uh, and this specific amount of memory is clearly separated between the application. So no other application can access that part of the memory uh, in any way. So it's a much more secure because you have the, your data that are saved uh, and no one can access them, but it's still fairly cheap uh, to be used because you are sharing the cost of the machine with others. And this is why this solution is the one that is most used nowadays and is probably going to be uh, the, the one that you will use the most in your whole uh, career. But still, if you have really high confidential date, uh, data, or you have so many uh, data and computational power to, uh, to be used that you cannot uh, have ad, uh, other people uh, sharing your space, there is still the possibility to have a dedicated server, which is what the, uh, the great colossus like Google and Amazon do inside their firm fa server farms. They have their dedicated servers running only their programs. And that's, it's fair to say that this is something that you should consider only in extreme cases because the cost of uh, buying and then managing uh, one server is so high that probably uh, if you really need to go there, you really need to have a lot of income from the service you want to offer. Uh, so, so just be sure that uh, dedicated server is the best solution for privacy and security, yet it's absolutely uneconomical in most of the cases in which uh, it, it is uh, desirable to have it. Uh, so again, please take this in mind and consider it. On the other hand, a service is a software functionality that can be reused by different clients for different purposes. So the idea is that I have uh, uh, something, I know how to uh, compute uh, something. For example, uh, going back to an example we have used before, uh, I know how to compute weather forecast. And I let other people use that uh, knowledge of mine on how to compute uh, the uh, weather forecast uh, and this can be done for free or by paying. But the idea is that uh, they are not required to redo things. They just call me and I uh, do all the work for them. And since nowadays there are so many services available on the network, uh, for the largest part of the application you will ever uh, have to do, uh, it's almost uh, always uh, created by integrating existing services uh, inside uh, your uh, your application and use those uh, those 
information somewhat differently from the others, you almost never write uh, the core elements of your system uh, by yourself. And also remember that services may be distributed. So actually the structure of how those services works uh, may really um, make your uh, architecture, to go back to other things we have used in this class, uh, uh, quite complex. Because actually, um, maybe my web, uh, my service for computing weather, uh, computing weather forecast is using uh, another service to keep track of the wind and another service that is going to keep a track of the uh, of the rain uh, percent uh, of the humidity percentage and those two servers may uh, those two services maybe use different servers around the world and so on and so forth so again uh, please consider the right level of abstraction and, and what you really need to do is go for the highest level uh, possible and stop there, otherwise you are going to get mad uh, pretty easily. And the, uh, the very basic concept of a service is that of application programming interfaces, often called API. Uh, and this is another case in which uh, when us engineers start talking about uh, uh, the APIs, um, many people that are not uh, from our field, so designers, for example, but also the management or whatever, think that we are going uh, for very geeky or nerdy uh, discussion like uh, mad scientists. But trust me, uh, this is so crucial and so important, especially if you want to deliver, if, you're, if your goal is to deliver a service to someone else, uh, that uh, the desi designing the right uh, API uh, may be uh, the, um, the key factor between the success or the failure of the whole uh, project. So what is an API actually? An API, uh, according to the traditional definition, uh, that is the one from 1989, uh, an API is a computer interface uh, specific to an application uh, or operating system to allow third parties to extend its functionality beyond uh, that which extend uh, out of the box. What the hell does it mean? It means that you have a code, uh, uh, something somewhere that can be uh, used to make some computation and you allow someone else to encapsulate uh, this uh, computation uh, inside its own uh, computation to reach a result that is beyond uh, what I can provide through my uh, code. Pretty easy, uh, pretty general. I mean, this definition is uh, wide, wide known and widespread, so uh, should not really um, make a lot of problem in try to understand what the hell does it mean. The problem is that nowadays this definition is a, a little bit outdated because today we refer to, uh, an API basically as uh, a third part, as someone else service available for a network. It's not the original meaning, but this is the, the meaning that nowadays is most used for uh, to describe and uh, understand what is an API. And the idea is, is that if someone asks to uh, uh, compute something, uh, he's able to do it through my uh, code, to my uh, service, uh, without the need to know anything on how I reach that uh, result. Um, so for example, I may also uh, create uh, the application on another, um, so, uh, sorry, I can make my service uh, running on another uh, um, programming language or on a completely different architecture uh, with respect to what um, the, uh, the other user think of, but yet uh, you're able to uh, access it uh, 
uh, use it uh, leading to a shareable public available computation uh, so that uh, you can use whatever I made uh, for uh, you can be uh, very, very uh, fast in programming and creating stuff in a very clever and easy way. So, uh, it has been already almost to. OK, I will try to rephrase myself. Um, let's make an example. Uh, and if, uh, suppose you um, you have this, I have this API for the weather forecast. Um, and suppose uh, that my weather forecast uh, is, um, is designed so that if you say me uh, your, the city and the date in which you want to uh, receive the weather forecast, I give you uh, uh, an information that is composed of sunny and rainy uh, percentage of uh, humidity forecasted and the um, um, and the percent and the uh, forecast of the millimeters of rain uh, in the um, that uh, is expected to be on that day in that location you do need to know how i compute all of this and how i reach uh, this information in any uh, in any way. You just know that if you want to uh, have the, the information, you give me the date and the location, and that's all. And suppose you want to make this for the uh, that Google uh, Google Calendar like application we discussed before. So you call me and say, okay, uh, I have. Uh, in this seven uh, uh, in seven days, uh, this user is going to have an appointment in Milan, in Parco Sempione. Uh, check if the weather if the uh, give me the the weather forecast, and then you look for the uh, uh, the weather forecast I give you. So it's sunny or rainy. Say it's sunny, fine. It's rainy, okay. I do something else you are extending the purpose of my simple weather forecast uh, system in giving advices to the user, yet you do not know how I, I, mm, I reached the conclusion that on uh, in seven days from now uh, it's going to be a sunny day in San Paco Sempione. And you don't care actually of how I make it. You just trust me that I make it right. But maybe my, uh, the same uh, API that you are using for that uh, is used by another program uh, somewhere else in the United States, for example, that is giving information to the, um, to the farmers on the best moment in which to, um, uh, to go to the fields and place the seeds. Because actually, you need to uh, have the right temperature um, and uh, uh, you have to be sure that for seven days for the moment, I don't know, I'm just uh, inventing now, but uh, suppose that uh, you need to know that for seven days after I place the seeds, uh, I must not have rainy, uh, rainy days. So you use this that other program, use the same information I gave you for a completely different purpose. And even him don't care about how I make the computation. He's just trust me, trusting that I made the computation right. So that's the key idea of how uh, application programming interfaces work now. Uh, have it been a little bit clearer or it's still uh, deep dark? Okay. Any other question, doubt, uh, whatever? Uh, because I think that now it can be a good moment to make uh, a 15 minutes break.
so that all of us can uh, get out of the room and take a little bit of air and uh, refresh the brains out. So I will stop now the recording and we will see uh, each other back in uh, 15, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but if you want to add other questions in the chat, please add them. I will answer uh, them uh, all back the moment we come back to the lecture.